Well, good morning. I want to thank uh, Pastor Caleb and Jared for boosting morale. My morale is high after all of that. I appreciate those guys. I also want to tell you a quick funny story about that video. Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, attempt at the video that you just watched, I had a whole different song picked out uh, for, for that uh, video. And I showed it to my family and uh, my daughter, Hannah, who sings up here, she said, you gotta, you got to change the music. The music's terrible. Uh, the, the music makes it sound like we're uh, doing a, a Save the Puppies commercial. You can't have that. You're, you're going to make everyone cry. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you uh, for those who uh, help out making sure I don't do dumb things. I like the music that she picked out. Uh, hopefully you do too. I'm excited about this new series. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, for a couple months. I'm really looking forward to this series called Be wise. And I want to ask you just an upfront question, get a little participation right up front. I'm going to ask if you would raise your hand, if you would say, I'm going to talk to the guys first. Guys, if you're married, by show of hands, how many of you men would say that you want to be a good husband? Y'all want to be a good husband. All right, great. Uh, Wives, if you're uh, married, ladies, if you're married, how many of you ladies would say, I, I want to be, I genuinely in my heart want to be a good wife? Okay, great. If you're sitting next to your spouse and they did not raise your hand, we can talk, we can talk later. Uh, but if you're a parent, if you are a grandparent, uh, genuinely in your heart, how many would say, I really do want to be a great parent. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a great, uh, good grandfather, good grandma, good, great. And I think that would be true. I think if we were to continue with that, do you want to be a good Jesus follower? Do you want to be a good friend? Uh, do you want to be a, a good member in the community? Whatever we would fill in the blank there, I think most of us would say, yeah, uh, whatever it is, whatever my role is, I, I want to be good at that. I want to be effective. I, I, uh, I want to be good at it. Uh, on the other side of that question, just because you want to be a good husband, a good parent, uh, a good follower of Jesus, you want that, doesn't necessarily mean that you will be. Because sometimes, just because you want something and the connection point to actually doing it, and those two things don't always meet up. And so what I would ask this of you is to consider where are you going to get the knowledge to know how to do that? And you don't have to answer that out loud. I just want you to think about it. Where are you pulling information? Where are you getting the knowledge and experience and discernment? Where are you pulling that from to become what it is that you want to be? I want to be a good husband. Great. Where are you going to get the knowledge, the experience, the, uh, the discernment to know how to actually do that and to become a good husband. Where are you getting that information? And, and I would uh, throw out just a few examples. Hopefully some of these examples uh, will connect with you. Uh, maybe you'd want to go to Judge Judy. You know, maybe that's who you want to... She seems wise. She seems smart. She gets paid a lot of money. She's on TV making decisions. Maybe that's who you want to get your information from and your discernment from. Uh, maybe, maybe Taylor Swift is who you want to get that uh, information from, right? She, she seems to talk about calm down and shake it off. That seems like solid advice, right? Yeah, I listen to the radio. I've heard these things. So uh, maybe, maybe Taylor Swift is who you want to get your discernment from and, and information on how to be what it is that you want to be. Maybe it's a politician, right? They seem to know what they're talking about. They seem to know what they're doing. Uh, maybe, maybe, how about this one? Uh, maybe it's not a politician, but how about your professors from college, right? They're really smart. Uh, they've read a lot of books. Uh, they seem to know what they're talking about when they're in the classroom. Maybe it's the professor. Maybe that's who we should run to to get uh, knowledge and information, discernment and experience from. How about this one? How about even from pastors, right? There, there's pastors uh, that are uh, saying things every week in churches all across America, across the world, uh, are, we, are we for sure that we know that the advice that they're giving, is it, is it rooted in God's word? How do we know for sure that what they're saying is good advice? Uh, just because they hold a title or a role in the, in the position of pastor, do we know for sure that what they're saying to us is good, solid, uh, knowledge-based uh, discernment stuff that we should follow? Before we apply any wisdom to our everyday lives, I think we should be asking those kind of questions. I think we should be asking, uh, where is this person, whoever it is? Wherever it is that you're pulling knowledge and information and discernment, this wisdom, wherever it is that you are pulling that from to know how to do what it is you want to do, be what it is you want to be, 
Uh, you should be asking questions of where are they getting their knowledge? Where, what, what kind of experiences are they pulling from in life to come to their conclusions, to offer their opinions? You know, wh- where did they pull discernment and knowledge from in the first place to make these judgments on what is right and what is wrong and the best way to do this or the best way to be that? I think you should be asking those kinds of questions. And this series is going to be about how God's wisdom is reliable. God's wisdom is trustworthy because he's God, because his knowledge is perfect and and is infinite. Yours isn't. Mine's not, but God's is. And, And God's understanding of all things, you know, you and I have limited amount of experience in life. And even if we read a bunch of books from people who have experiences in life that we haven't had, you know, we can get knowledge from that. But God is unlimited in all of these things, knowledge and experience. Uh, He is unlimited. So if we're we're talking about uh, who we would want to go to, to pull out information, discernment, and how to apply knowledge, how to apply experience in in, in life uh, into wisdom, this is where we would want to go. Applying God's truth, applying God's wisdom uh, to our everyday lives. And here's what happens. When you and I learn how to apply God's wisdom, God's truth to our everyday lives, what we're going to learn in this series is it's going to make your life better. I didn't say easier, but it will make your life better. And we'll, we'll figure that out as we go along what the word better means, right? Because better doesn't always mean more pleasant. Better doesn't always mean easier. Better, uh, talks, uh, better is the idea of something of greater significance or value to your life. And, and so we're going to see how applying God's word, God's truth, God's wisdom to your everyday life makes life better. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to introduce this letter to you this morning. We see that the author of this letter in the first verse is the Apostle Paul. If you are familiar with the Apostle Paul, you know his story. For those of you who are not familiar with Paul, his name wasn't always Paul. At one point in his life, it was Saul. And Saul was a a rising star in the Jewish faith. Uh, uh, This uh, group called the Pharisees, uh, extremely bright and passionate about his his faith, about Judaism. And when, uh, when Jesus comes along and these Jesus followers, they start to spread their message that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jewish people have been waiting for, he, like many others, rejected that. It can't be Jesus. That's not who we were expecting. That's not who we were looking for. It's not him. You guys are liars and you're blasphemers. And Paul, uh, when he was still Saul, went after these people for imprisonment, execution, and he did it fervently. On his way to one of the cities, the uh, city of Damascus, uh, to persecute Christians, Uh, He had an interaction, though, a miraculous interaction with Jesus Christ. And it was through that interaction with Jesus that he came uh, to to believe that Jesus is exactly who he claimed to be, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one uh, that uh, the Jewish people had been waiting for. He he is the spiritual deliverer uh, that uh, that had been promised. And uh, he was transformed. He was transformed from a persecutor of the church to one of the church's greatest missionaries of all time, wrote most of our New Testament. Right? An incredible transformation that God did in Saul's life when he became Paul. So that's who Paul is. He's the writer of this letter. And then in verse 2, we see who the letter was written to. It's written to God's church in Corinth. Now just pause on that phrase, God's church. Church. That's not a, a, a label, it's not a brand, God's church. Uh, when he writes God's church, he is identifying uh, the word church in the original language in the first century. It just meant gathering of people. And so you could have a pagan gathering of people. You could have a, a social gathering of people. You'd use the same word. He's distinguishing between other types of gatherings and that of the gathering of Jesus followers, the gathering of God's people to to worship God, to follow Jesus. That's why he's distinguishing that. And this particular group of Jesus followers in the city of Corinth, Paul actually established this church in the year 50. 
Uh, so 50 years after uh, the birth of Christ, and uh, he was there for about a year and a half, establishing this church. And he established this church in a city uh, that was very wealthy. Corinth was extremely wealthy. It was a port city. A lot of commerce went through the city of Corinth. Uh, tons of money poured into Corinth. And uh, they were known. This city was defined uh, by those who wanted to get more and more money. They were driven by more and more wealth. And they were also driven by more and more pleasure. That was the other thing that defined the people in Corinth. They had no limits. In their minds, there were no limits on sexuality. Very immoral city, driven by a desire for wealth, a desire for pleasure with no limits on sexuality. In fact, in the ancient world, to be called a Corinthian, uh, people knew that there was a certain lifestyle associated with that title, with that name. It would be kind of like if you called someone a barbarian. If you use that word, there's certain, uh, a certain lifestyle, a certain culture that goes along with the title barbarian. And in the ancient world, in the first century, uh, that certainly would have been true. If you called someone a Corinthian, you knew you meant there was a certain lifestyle associated with that person. It would be like planting a church in modern day in Las Vegas. That would be very challenging, a very challenging place to plant a church because there's an ingrained culture, there's an ingrained lifestyle in Las Vegas that's part of that city, part of the fabric of the, of the way that people think and view life. And uh, so this was a challenging place, but uh, Paul establishes a church there, a year and a half, uh, spends, moves on to Ephesus. After about four or five years in Ephesus, Paul gets word from some people in the church in Corinth, they've got problems. They've got problems of sexual sin. There's immorality happening in their church. There's dissension. You've got some groups that are uh, dissenting and causing problems with other uh, cliques within the, within the church. There's these problems. Uh, people aren't unified. And, and he, uh, he gets word that this is, is happening. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this letter that you have in your lap uh, he inspired Paul to write this letter to the church of Corinth who had been applying the wisdom of the world to their lives and to their local church instead of applying the wisdom of God to their lives and to the local church. And so this uh, letter, uh, I think is, it's, it's a very practical letter. Now, I will say there's lots of differences between the church in the first century in Corinth and our own church. Not just time, not just a space and time, uh, but we're a rural community church, right? There's a certain culture here in the cove and in the rural community. And they're an urban, they were a very much urban city uh, church. And so that, was, that would be different. Uh, we've also, this particular church has been uh, around, we've been established a long time. Uh, this church was first planted back in the late 1930s, right? Now there's been a lot of uh, growth, obviously, throughout the years, but uh, this church has been around a long time, and there are people uh, in our church, our family of believers, that have been uh, Christians for a long, long time, and, and we benefit from that wisdom. We benefit from their testimony and their example. The church in Corinth, that, uh, at that particular time when this letter was written, like six years old, and so the people who are in it, uh, they're young believers. They're inexperienced in their faith. And so the fact that they are struggling with certain things, that makes sense, uh, especially the city that they live in, and they're trying to battle back, about, or battle back against some of these things. Uh, all that makes sense. But the, the letter is, is very practical. We're going to talk about uh, issues in marriage. Paul addresses practical issues like how to have a stronger marriage and just some of the things uh, surrounding that subject matter of love and marriage. He talks about priorities. How do you establish God-honoring Priorities. Paul addresses that uh, throughout the letter. How about self-discipline? Uh, we, I think, would want, if we want to be a good dad, a good husband, all these different things, there's some self-discipline issues that would go along with that, and Paul addresses uh, some of those issues. Uh, he also uh, addresses um, some, of the, uh, some of the other issues that would relate to the local church. Now, I mentioned one of them. Uh, there was dissension and sexual immorality, and he talks about uh, some of the, the things that were happening. So I think it's a very 
uh, practical letter, I think it's going to be very helpful to us. Even though there are a lot of differences uh, between our churches, we still, in our culture, we still uh, have to push back against sexual immorality, right? We still have to, uh, we still have to push back against uh, some of the things that our culture would, would define as, as uh, how, you, how you should prioritize your lives. And it doesn't always match up with the way that God would have us prioritize our lives. So I think it's a very helpful letter. I think, I think, uh, I th- I think throughout the next two months, uh, we should find a lot of benefits from studying it. So what we're going to talk about is the wisdom of God and how the wisdom of God being reliable, being trustworthy, when we apply it to our everyday lives, is going to make our lives better. As we study through this book together, I want you to know that the way I organized the study, I think that's helpful that uh, you know how I organized it. I organized it by theme. So there's 15 chapters, and uh, what I did was I put all of the different uh, themes that kind of go together. I collected those and put them together over an 11-week period rather than study it as a verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter study, which is nothing wrong with doing that. It's just not how I organized it. And uh, for you to get the most out of our, our time together on Sunday, here's what I'm going to ask of you. I have on the website, if you're using a tablet or your phone, uh, when you go home, uh, if you don't have access to those things, there's a paper back there, just a flyer, that has every topic that we're going to look at over the next two months and the chapters that will go with it. For example, today we're talking about the gospel, the, uh, the wisdom of the gospel, And uh, you'll find that Paul addresses these things in chapter 1 and chapter 2. But this whole idea of dissension within the church is happening within uh, chapter 1 and chapter 3. So uh, for you to be able to follow along with how I've organized it, I think it will be helpful for you this week to have that guide. Read the chapters that are going to go along with what we're going to talk about next weekend so that when you come, you are prepared. If you do that... You have read through the entire letter, all 15 chapters of 1 Corinthians over these two months and hopefully be as uh, prepared as possible for what we talk about on the weekend. Here we go. We're going to start this morning. If you want to pull out your notes, whether it's the paper copy you got when you came in or online, uh, we're going to start with this this morning. How can we be wise about the gospel? What's it mean to be wise about the gospel, and how can we learn how the wisdom of God, the wisdom of the gospel, how does that really make our lives better? That's where we're going this morning. I want to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Paul says, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus. We'll just pause there for a moment. When he talks about those who belong to Christ, he's talking about those who have trusted in Jesus, who have trusted the message of the gospel. I think it's important that before we go any further with our talk this morning, that we take a moment and talk about and and clearly define what we mean by the word gospel. I don't want to make the assumption that everyone in the room knows what that word means. I know for myself, uh, I don't really like it when I'm, let's say you've got a conversation of a couple people and I'm like the third one in the conversation or whatever, and you, you've, you're talking about a topic that I don't really know much about and there are words being used that I don't really know what they mean, I feel kind of out of place. You've got two mechanics, right? Two mechanics are talking uh, car talk and and the one saying, yeah, you, you got to do something with the master cylinder and these calipers are bad. And, and I chime in and say, yeah, you don't want caterpillars in your, in your cylinders. Man, you get caterpillars in there and, and they'll, they'll mess that. And butterflies flying out of your car, it'd be bad. You don't, so you feel foolish, right? If you don't know what's being talked about, if you don't understand the words that are being used. And I don't want to make the assumption that just everybody in the room knows what we mean when we say the word gospel. So the word gospel simply means good news. So what is the good news of Jesus Christ? Let's let's walk through that. It simply means this. You and I are born sinful. You and I are born into this world spiritually separated from a holy God. 
That's how we're born into this world. And that might not sound like good news, but here's the good news that goes with that. Even though that's the condition that you and I are born into this world, sinners separated from a holy God, the good news is that God provided a way for you and I, enemies of God, to be made right, to be reconciled with a holy God. You and I can't earn that. We, uh, we aren't able to, uh, in some way, figure out how we can deserve it, because that's never going to happen. So God provided a way for us to be reconciled to him. And this is the way that God provided. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to come and be a sinless, a perfect sacrifice on the cross. To make that payment to satisfy God's wrath against our sin. That's what Jesus did on the cross. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you go down to the end of that chapter, look at verse 30. Paul talks about some of the things that, that take place spiritually because of being, or, or, or when we are connected to Jesus Christ through faith. These are some of the things that happen spiritually to us. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. You didn't do that. The church didn't do that for you. Jesus did that. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure. He made us holy. He freed us from sin. That's why the scripture says, if you're going to boast about anything, you better boast about Jesus, not about yourself, because you didn't figure it out, you didn't deserve it, and you didn't earn it. Our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption, all of those things are connected to Jesus Christ, faith in Him as our forgiver of sin, as our giver of eternal life. The only way of being made right with God is by admitting that we are sinners, separated from a holy God with no way of making ourselves right with God, and then trusting Jesus Christ as our only means of being made right with God, our only means of forgiveness, accepting by faith that gift of grace that God is offering us through Jesus as our rescuer, as our reconciler, the leader of our life. So this is the gospel. This is what we mean when we say the good news. Jesus did everything for us. We simply trust him to keep his promises to us. And I think that's something to be thankful for. I think if I were to ask you, are you thankful for the gospel? Uh, every believer in the room would say, absolutely, I'm thankful for the gospel. If you go back to verse 4, Paul says as much, I'm thankful to my God for you and the gracious gifts he has given you. And we'll talk about those later on in the letter. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus, through him, God has enriched your church in every way. With all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He'll keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Christ Jesus Christ returns. God will do this. Why? Because God is faithful to do what he says. He's invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have a lot to be thankful for when we talk about the gospel, um, not the least of which is the fact that it's making a difference in our lives. And that's what he's talking about here. You, yes, we have uh, hope beyond the grave, which is an incredible blessing, but we also have the Holy Spirit making a difference in our lives and in the life of our church. The gospel of Jesus doesn't just give us eternal hope beyond the grave. It makes a difference in our everyday lives. I don't know if you noticed some of the, the screens this morning, the backgrounds of the songs and even some of the song choices. Uh, we were talking about, and even visually, uh, some of the storms in life, some of the difficulties and struggles that we go through in life. And the gospel uh, reminds us that, that there are better days coming. No matter what we go through in life, it's not permanent. Even the hardest day, even the darkest day is temporary because we have a hope beyond this life. That's the gospel that we have to be thankful for. And so Paul is thankful for the gospel. We are. But then Paul says something else about the gospel that we need to understand. Look at verse 18. This is really important. When we talk about the wisdom of the gospel, do you really trust in the wisdom of the gospel? 
Well, verse 18 says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. So for those who do not uh, trust Christ as their Savior, for those who do not have a faith relationship with God, the message that we talk about, right, this message of the gospel and the cross, it's foolishness to them. It doesn't make any sense. But we who are being saved, we know it's the very power of God. We go on, uh, we talk about uh, the Jew and the Gentile a little bit later on. He also addresses uh, the smart people in, in the room. Uh, he says in verse 20, Where does this leave the philosopher? Where does this leave the scholar? Where does this leave the brilliant debaters? Right? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. It's not something that you figured out because you're really smart. It's not something that uh, you figured out because you're clever or uh, because you uh, have read a lot of different uh, ph philosophical type books. Um, that's not how you figured it out. God revealed the gospel truth to you. Verse 21, since God, his wisdom, saw to it the world, would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It's foolish, he says, to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, to the Jewish person in the first century, for many of them. Uh, the whole message of the cross, the message of Jesus Christ, didn't make any sense to them. They rejected it uh, because they were expecting, they were looking for their Messiah to be a political deliverer. They would roll into Jerusalem and, and overthrow Rome and establish Israel again as a superpower. And that's not what happened with Jesus. And I, well, It doesn't make sense to us that this carpenter from, from uh, Galilee in the middle of nowhere who died on a cross as a criminal, he's the guy? It didn't make sense to them. And it was, it was an obstacle. It was an offense to them. To the Gentile, to the Greek, uh, and, and their way of looking at life is much like ours. Uh, logic and, and philosophy uh, drives the way that they look at life and the way that they uh, look at information. And to them, something very similar. You're, you're, you're telling me that some guy dies on a cross and somehow that's connected to eternal life? It doesn't logically make sense. It didn't connect for, for the Gentile. So the experts didn't figure it out. The interpreters didn't figure it out. The writers, the philosophers, the debaters, none of their knowledge, none of their experience or judgment led them to the knowledge of who God is personally. God revealed the wisdom of the gospel to you and to me. What that means is we can't take credit for figuring out what the cross is all about. You can't come in here and look at that symbol or see someone wearing a cross necklace. Ah, I get what that means. God has to reveal this to us. We go on and we find out in the second chapter that it's not, it's not even something that preachers can take credit for. Verse 1 of chapter 2, When I came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid, trembling. My message, my preaching were very plain. And rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of of God. Now he goes on in the next verse to talk about there is value in, in wisdom you know, when it comes to putting together good preaching. It's not that there's no value in good preaching. His point is that the gospel is not something that a human preacher can take credit for you understanding and explaining in a way that you'll accept it. The, the wisdom to understand and accept and believe the gospel doesn't come from a great sermon. It comes from the Holy Spirit who uses a sermon to bring spiritual understanding. And some of you are like, okay, well, that makes sense. I understand why Pastor Mark's sermon is so boring then. He doesn't work on them because what's the point, right? No, I work on sermons. I work hard on them. But I can't take credit for the spiritual understanding that you walk away with. I can't take credit for the, the change in your soul, in your life. That's the Holy Spirit that does that. Not a great sermon. So Paul's point is that the gospel, it doesn't make sense to human wisdom. It doesn't make sense to human intelligence. 
It's not something that you figured out on your own. It's not something that, uh, that a preacher can take credit for, that he made it so plain and, and you got it. That's, it's, it's God. It's through the Holy Spirit. It's not how we would have done it. It's not who we would have offered salvation to. The wisdom of God, his point, you know, the wisdom of the gospel, if you were to say, how are you going to save mankind from sin and hell? This isn't the plan we would have come up with. And yet the wisdom of God, even though on paper to our human intelligence it doesn't make sense, spiritually we get it because the Holy Spirit helps us, helps us understand it. Okay, now at this point, we've walked through understanding what Paul's saying, the gospel isn't something that intelligence figures out. Uh, it's not something that you, uh, you figured out on your own. God reveals it to you through the Holy Spirit. And you might, I hope, at this point are asking, so what? What, what does that have to do with my every day life. So what? I can't take credit for figuring out the gospel. So what? That, uh, that, that God's the one who revealed it to me. I don't think I'm that smart anyway, so that's fine with me. Why does all of this matter? Here's why it matters. On your notes page, I have a fill in the blank. This is what I'd like you to do. I'd like to fill in the blanks there that says this. Trusting the wisdom of God for the gospel. The gospel on paper doesn't make sense. Not to our intelligence, not to human understanding. But if we're going to trust in the wisdom of God for the gospel, which if you're saved, you do, then that should lead us to trust in the wisdom of God for life, for your everyday life. If I'm going to trust in a plan that God put together to save my soul, that from human reason doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to trust it because God's revealed this is the truth. Okay, and I accept that by faith. If I'm going to do that, that should lead me to trust God and His wisdom in my everyday life, even when it doesn't make sense, and I can't see it, and I don't understand it. I'm just going to ask. I don't want you to answer out loud. You can write it down if you want, or just at least think about it. Is there something in your life right now something in your life right now that if you had the power to change it, you would. You would snap your fingers if you could and you would change it. Maybe it's a health problem. Maybe it's a financial struggle that you're walking through right now. Maybe it's even something about yourself that if you could, you would change it. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was better looking. I wish I was more talented. Whatever it, we would fill in the blank with, I would change this in an instant if I could. Is there something in your life like that? See, trusting in the wisdom of God for the gospel should lead us to trust in the wisdom of God for our everyday lives, even the things that don't make sense, even the things that we can't change on our own because it's not how we would have done it. It's not the plan we would have come up with. I think I've shared with you before that I have the honor of being right now currently the president of our national ministerium, which gives me the opportunity to... You know, go to different conferences and lead a particular board. Uh, and there have been many times, there have been many times when I sit around a table with, with a group of men who help lead this, this national board, I sit around the table with these guys, and, and there, are, there are many of them that are just brilliant. They're so much smarter than I am. I am and, and there are men around that table that I would say are a much stronger, much better leader than I am. And there are times when I, I say, God, I don't get it. I don't understand. I would not have picked me. I don't understand this. But see, the wisdom of God, if I'm going to trust in the wisdom of God for the gospel, which doesn't make sense on paper, and that should lead me to trust God for whatever he wants to do in my life, even if I'm not the one he would have picked, even if it's not the plan I would have put together. You know, we read verses like Romans 8, 28. A lot of you memorized that when you were growing up. Romans 8, 28. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and call it according to his purpose, his good plan. We, we memorize it, we quote it to one another when we're struggling, when we're hurting. But isn't there a temptation there at times in life to say, I don't get it. I don't see it, God. I don't see how this is something that you're going to somehow turn into something good. I don't, I don't see it. I don't get your wisdom on this. Isn't that tempting? We, we, we read the verse, we know we should believe it and accept it and live in it, 
But there's times it's like, God, I, I, it doesn't look like there's something good where I'm standing. You know, Pastor Matt Plott is doing an incredible job down at our Juniata campus and getting things turned around, and I'm so thrilled. Uh, he's been a great asset for our team already, and I think uh, that the future there is bright, and he's the right man, that God chose the right man to help us turn that church around. But if you were to ask me, hey, we've, we've got five plans. We've got five different plans here for you to pick from uh, so that Pastor Matt would be in this position to lead this church into a new day. I'm just being honest. I wouldn't have picked the one that said, your dad's going to die. Right? I, I wouldn't have picked that one. That's the, the, in the wisdom of God, that's what he chose to do, and I get it. I accept it by faith. I'm just saying it's not the way I would have done it. But we're not relying on Pastor Mark's wisdom, thankfully. We're relying on the wisdom of God. When we walk through life, if I'm going to trust in the wisdom of God for the gospel, then I had better be ready to trust in the wisdom of God as he unfolds his plan for my life and for this church and for that church. You know, if you're standing, if you and I would have been standing where Mary was and where John was and standing at the foot of the cross and watching Jesus die, right, in that moment, to watch an innocent man suffer and die what would have looked like needlessly, pointlessly, it had to have felt like, where is the good in this? And yet what was happening right in front of them is that Jesus was dying that sinless death penalty for your sin and for mine. Even though it didn't make sense at the time. You know, you and I, we, we read through our Bibles and we read certain instructions in the Word of God. And we're going to read tons of them as we walk through 1 Corinthians together. There are certain boundaries that God sets for us and, and, and certain limits that God says and certain things that God says. This is what your attitude should look like. This is what your behavior should look like. And, and these are the things that should and shouldn't come out of your mouth, right? You know that that stuff's in here. And yet there are times when we're tempted to say, yeah, I see what it says, yeah, but the rules I don't think should apply to me. It's not how I would have written the rules for myself. I think I might know better than God. I think I might be smarter than God and I would do it a different way. I don't know if you would say that out loud, but sometimes our behaviors say that pretty loud. Trusting in the wisdom of God for the gospel should lead us to trust in the wisdom of God for our everyday lives. What he's doing in our life and the way that God says to live our lives. Yes, the gospel doesn't make sense from a human standpoint of, of intelligence and human wisdom. It's something we need God to reveal to us. It's something we need God to help us understand and believe. And I'm just going to ask, has God revealed the truth of the gospel to your heart that, that you can understand it? Then if so, have you taken that step of faith to accept the gift of grace that God is offering through His Son, Jesus Christ. And if not, take that step today. And if you have, then just please don't ever forget that if you're going to trust in the wisdom of God with the gospel, that should lead your heart to trust Him and His wisdom for your everyday life. If you can trust God with your eternal soul, then you can trust God with, and you can fill in the blank. In fact, I would encourage you to do that on your notes page somewhere or maybe in your conversations over lunch. Just take some time. If I'm going to trust God with my eternal soul, then, then I need to learn how to trust him with, and you fill in the blank. Trusting the wisdom of God for the gospel should lead us to trust in the wisdom of God for everyday lives. And if we're willing to do that, it's going to make your life better. It's going to make your life better.